Welcome to Prithyamatra. Last year, 2020, uh, was the 15th consecutive year uh, that Freedom House reported a decline in the global state of democracy. According to the Economic Intelligence Unit's measure of democracy, only about half of the world's population live in a democracy of some sort. And even fewer reside in a full democracy. Uh, more than one third of the world's population live under authoritarian rule. Uh, while uh, there may be a diversity of opinion on the degree to which the democratic space is, is shrinking in a specific contexts, uh, there is an across the board consensus that we are facing the trend of democratic backsliding in many countries in many regions. Is South Asia one of them? What specific challenges we are facing? What opportunities are there to invest in? Uh, what lessons have we learned from decades of democracy assistance programs, and where do we go from here? Uh, today's episode, which is the first in a series of four shows structured around the themes of the upcoming virtual December Democratic, Democracy Summit, will attempt at exploring these pertinent questions in the context of South Asia. Uh, today's theme is defending against authoritarianism, uh, to discuss which, I have three eminent guests uh, with me, Mr. Andrew Wilson, the Executive Director of the Center for International Private Enterprise, SAI, a uh, US-based nonprofit organization that works to strengthen democracy through private enterprise and market-oriented reform since 1983. Dr. Kim Becher, SAI's Director for Policy and Program Learning, and our very own Professor Dr. Ali Riyadh, an expert author on South Asia and a distinguished professor at the Illinois State University, USA. Uh, welcome to the show. I'll uh, begin with a question that I have for all three of today's guests. And uh, the question is, in your opinion, as far as the state of democracy is concerned, where do you think where the world is at? Uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Riaz, uh, uh, I would like to start with you uh, and uh, the state of democracy in South Asia, and then go to our guests from side. Professor Riaz. Thank you, Zilur. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and with Kim and Andrew to speak about a very difficult question in the sense that the situation that we are in globally in terms of democracy is not exactly a very optimistic situation. Uh, uh, globally, as, you, as we all know, the, it has been for the past decade and a half, we are witnessing the democratic backsliding quite significantly all around the world. South Asia, for example, I would say the state of democracy in South Asia has been the worst in the past two decades, from my understanding. If we take the countries, particularly, say, India, which has been considered as the largest democracy of the world, or at least until recently, that is how it has been described. But unfortunately, since 2014, and especially since 2019, we have seen the spectacular erosion of democracy under Modi regime. It has been described as an electoral autocracy by varieties of demo uh, democracy within. Similarly, we have seen it has been listed as uh, partly free by the Freedom House for understandable reason. Uh, the institutions are not exactly working as they used to, at least for the first 60, 70 years of Indian independence. If you look at Pakistan, it has always been considered as a hybrid regime where military played a pivotal role. And lately, it hasn't gone away under Mr. Imran Khan. Rather, we are witnessing the increasing influence, not only of the military, but also the radical Islamist forces. Recently, the government has come up with an agreement with a militant organization. I would describe it as a militant organization. It seems that the veto power is shifting, not only the military, which has been now we're adding another element to it, which is not good for democracy. It doesn't reflect good democracy. Sri Lanka, we have seen the majoritarianism, and then Rajapakse dynasty is in, is in making. It is not democracy. Uh, as for your audience, we don't have to speak at length about Bangladesh. They're experiencing two consecutive elections, rigged and absolutely unacceptable elections have taken place. Not only that, if you look at the laws that have been passed and implemented, have shrunk the democratic space remarkably. Opposition are being per persecuted, space for freedom of expression, 
has reached a very low level and uh, freedom of assembly, uh, we are witnessing that it is almost non-existent. So what I describe is a culture of fear in Bangladesh. For that matter, uh, you know, uh, 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 Maldives, uh, we had great expectation. So I can go by every country, even Nepal is not showing very much of a positive side. All these things indicate that the state of democracy in South Asia seems to be on a downward spiral and the democratic backsliding. There is state-led debilitation of the democracy and institution is ongoing, which is very, very, you know, disconcerting. I am really concerned because, as I say, I, I, I don't think it has been as bad as in the past two decades. So that is what I see within the context of salvation. Uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, do you agree with uh, Dr. Ria's analysis uh, of the state of democracy, or do you have a more optimistic assessment of the situation? Mr. Wilson. Well, I, I certainly can concur with Dr. Ria's um, observations of what's going on in South Asia, but uh, I, you know, I've been in this, uh, in this uh, uh, job for many years, and I, I think you have to be an optimist uh, to be engaged in, in democracy support programs. So I'm always at least an idealist when it comes to, to looking to people for, for finding their way through when democracy is challenged. But I think we have to admit um, that there has been a, a backsliding, if you will, over the last 15 years. I would, I would place the start of, the, of, of the, the current tests for democracy back at the economic crisis in 2008, uh, when people really started to question um, the globalist economic model that we've, we've all been prospering under, you know, and also we've seen the rise of, uh, even within the region, of, of authoritarian uh, uh, power um, that can provide growth in the short term, uh, whether it can in the long term. So, so there have been alternatives that have been coming up that uh, authoritarians and populists have played on uh, to, to sort of look at, uh, look at people's unhappiness and, and curtail freedom. You know, the thing about democracy is, is that it's not an easy uh, system of governance. It's messy. Uh, it's hard work. Uh, it does deliver in the long run for its citizens, but it really it tests, it, at the best of times, it can test the patience of voters and, and, and others. Um, and I think that's really what we're seeing at this point in time, is that in the 2000s and up to the last, uh, even over the last decade, Democracy has uh, kind of failed to deliver. Globalization has failed to deliver, especially in our, my country, but in other places, has failed to deliver um, prosperity for people. Uh, globalization and culture has felt people feel more alienated from their, their domestic culture, their home cultures. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it just feeds into this feeling of disconnection. Uh, and that, that feeds back into political discontent. And that's when you see the rise of of, of populists, that's when you see people start to question whether or not um, their their political systems are working well for them. That's when you see the rise of, of religious extremism. Uh, and then what you do see also on the opposite side of this is that authoritarians, some of them uh, in the countries that, that Dr. Riaz has referred to, uh, are using this to really as an excuse to, to keep their own corrupt systems alive and floating and to keep their own crony systems alive and floating, saying, you know what, we need to be homegrown. We need to be focused uh, on our own path to development. Therefore, the, the path that our country is on is, is, is right for our country. And so when you have that happen, immediately what you see is a sidelining of democratic voices because they are telling people, no, we have to sacrifice, we have to work, uh, we have to keep at this. And when you're feeling as disconnected and if you're feeling economically challenged, that's not, a, that's not a, a message you want to hear. You want to hear from people who tell you they have an easy path. Uh, and I think people are now starting to see that the easy path perhaps may not be as easy as they thought, and it might actually be destructive. And I think on top of that, we've seen the effect of not only of the, of the economic crisis many years ago, but of the COVID crisis. And COVID has also exacerbated, I think, these feelings that people aren't in control of their life. Uh, that somehow they've lost control. And that's where populists, that's where authoritarians are able to creep in. And it, certainly at the, at the big early stages of the COVID crisis, we thought we saw authoritarians put forth a model that seemed to be effectively dealing with 
with COVID and our own systems tragically struggled to deal with it. But I think as we look, and part of the reason why I remain an optimist, when we see the resilience of democracies in responding to COVID, as they develop drugs, as they get treatments out, uh, as, as they're able to restore people, people's lives to some sense of normalcy with freedom, uh, I think we're going to see people start to look at, at uh, democracies as being more resilient uh, and as being, a, a, uh, a, in the long term, better for their own prosperity and health. Uh, Dr. Betcher, uh, do these uh, patterns and dynamics uh, described by Dr. Riaz and Mr. Wilson hold true roughly across the board? Um, are there any uh, outliers to these uh, tide of authoritarianism uh, that one can be hopeful about? Dr. Betcher. Yes, there's, there's cause for concern and, and there's also reason for hope. I think looking at the, the trends of, of recent years, uh, there's been an atmosphere of, of gloom and doom, and uh, I would argue that this has been overstated. Uh, you can always find um, outliers in any direction, and, and they can get a lot of attention. I mean, the, the authoritarian successes, um, like, like, like Singapore, um, has got lots of press, um, but we, we sort of focus on um, one Singapore and you know, ignore the, the Zimbabwe's of the world or the, the Venezuela's. Um, in terms of democratic hope, um, you know, Sudan, um, we, we see people, um, civilians uh, fighting for a, a new uh, democratic form of government um, after uh, the, the military transition to, to civilian and combined rule. Um, Colombia is um, still holding on um, after establishing uh, a peace agreement some years ago with uh, the leftist guerrillas. Uh, every country has its challenges, but they're hanging on. Uh, Tunisia remains uh, uh, a symbol of hope for um, the Middle East region. Uh, Nepal, um, while it's had its constitutional problems and, and corruption is, is significantly freer than it was at the beginning of the century, uh, Moldova um, has, has moved in a positive direction. And for context, uh, we have to remember that at the turn of the century, we had unprecedented numbers of democracies around the world that we had never seen in history. And uh, that, that set a very high expectation, um, maybe a kind of complacency. Very many of those uh, democracies at the beginning of the century were electoral democracies, maybe illiberal democracies. They were not very well established. Um, they did not have um, consolidated uh, democratic norms and, and institutions. And so like in the, the post-Soviet space or, or maybe Cambodia, many of these were not very serious democracies to begin with. Uh, similarly, as we see some of the advance of authoritarianism, authoritarians haven't necessarily consolidated their gains. I think Dr. Riaz mentioned uh, hybrid regimes. There's a lot of competitive authoritarian <laughs> systems where um, they're kind of stuck in the middle and um, Things are being still played out, so uh, it's it's not necessarily um, strong movement towards authoritarianism. And I, I would point to the the, the resilience of the, of the the embrace of democracy around the world. Um, we, public opinion polling consistently shows that the majority of people in most countries uh, prefer democracy to other forms of government. Uh, we've seen this from, from Pew Research. We've seen this from um, the World Values Survey and various uh, democracy barometers. And the, the numbers of protests around the world um, are up. Um, and, and we've seen people come out and protest against corruption. They don't take it anymore. It's no longer embedded in culture. Um, people in Belarus have put on a, a brave fight. So we've seen a, a lot of um, popular protest. And... Um, and the final thing I would say is that the authoritarian regimes are not always strong as they like to project. Um, they're, they're, they're good at showing that um, externally that, that, that they have ways of getting things done, but they have their own in, internal challenges. And I, I think uh, both in terms of um, their ability to adapt and perform over the long term as innovative economies, and um, they have a very limited basis of legitimacy. Uh, Dr. Bichar, uh, SAIP is an organization currently running uh, more than 200 projects in 80 countries across the world. And you led uh, SAIP's policy and program learning department and must have a wealth of program learning to translate, in, uh, translate into policy concepts uh, and a variety of policy ideas to put to the 
uh, test of practice uh, through uh, pragmatic interventions. Uh, what are the types of programmatic uh, interventions revealing about challenges uh, facing democracy in today's world? There are some common challenges, and I think the first thing to note is that there has been steady erosion of democratic institutions. You can call it the, the death by a thousand cuts. So we do not see uh, military coups so often anymore. Uh, the recent coup in Myanmar is a bit more of, a, of an exception these days. Uh, what, what we have is authoritarians who are dismantling the pieces of democracy in a calculated way over time. So um, attacks on uh, the free media, attacks on the independence of the courts, um, undermining the, the quality of, of, the, of the civil service and, and politicizing and interfering with um, the, the public space for uh, non-government organizations or for open um, electoral processes. So there's that institutional attack, a very slow and steady attack. Um, Inequality is uh, definitely um, top of people's minds today. And although global inequality has come down and um, the level of standard of living has, has increased um, across the world, um, inequality within countries has become more pronounced. And we see people who are um, not really able to access the, the benefits of um, globalization and, and, and prosperity and this is um, leading to people feeling that they don't have a stake in the system uh, or, or feeling that um, there, there's corruption or, or that, that, that things are rigged against them. So uh, both inequality and the erosion of institutions are together uh, undermining trust. And uh, if you have mobilized people who don't have much trust in, in the institutions, um, in their governments, then it's a very um, unsettled situation. Uh, we're, we're concerned about um, authoritarian learning, um, both learning from um, experience and, and, and learning from each other. Um, since sort of the heyday of, of democracy in the, the 1990s, uh, authoritarians have, have, have changed their game. Um, they're uh, maybe maybe less totalitarian, maybe open more in their, their economic models, uh, not feeling that they need to um, produce all the answers, but they found ways to uh, undermine democracy and create doubt and, and, and disinformation. And they're, they're playing these um, democratic style games, right? This is the, the competitive authoritarianism where they, um, they pay lip service to democracy and they, they allow elections and they allow some form of opposition um, to exist, but, uh, but the freedom isn't there. And uh, then I, I think from a programmatic point of view, I would say we are often able to support local actors around the world in pursuing their objectives, their policy dreams, you know, their desire to, to have a voice in, in the way they're governed. And they, they create practical reforms, right? And, and whether it's in, in, in infrastructure, um, getting, getting the lights on, you know, cleaning the streets or um, changing the, the, the tax system to uh, a more rational and, um, and equitable system. And the problem is that a lot of these reforms are, are, are on paper. They're, they're not implemented, implementation gaps uh, have been a, a crucial problem that SIPE has seen. And so the quality of governance, you know, what happens in the policy space and the, the enforcement and the execution of policy is, is really critical. So uh, Kenya had uh, laws that uh, went through like 2012, you know, to, and, and earlier to, 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 to formalize the informal sector, to, to create more opportunities for micro and small business, to give more people Kind of, kind of a chance, and uh, they're they're pretty good laws. They just haven't been enforced. Uh, and ultimately, what it comes down to is uh, collective action problems. You know, the majorities of people would, would benefit from greater economic opportunities, um, greater um, opportunities to hold governments accountable collectively. But they have to organize. They have to come together, and and that is the trick. If you have divided oppositions, if you have civil society that's 
that's fragmented. If people can't kind of aggregate their issues, and that's what that's what site works at, right? So building building coalitions. Um, just one example uh, from Nigeria, the coalition of um, Nigerian business women's associations. So over several years, we've supported a group that now has 52 organizations representing 4 million women in business, and they're successfully pressing their case for access to finance, um, better security, and, and less discrimination. So ultimately, it comes down to uh, collective action. And Mr. Wilson, uh, you have witnessed a site design and implement a democracy assistance program for 25 years. Uh, that is uh, two thirds of its life. How has the nature of opportunities to support democratic governance globally changed through these years? And what lessons can be learned from uh, these shifting dynamics that can help us address the set of challenges uh, to democracy identified by Dr. Peter? Well, certainly I think that, you know, we have seen lots of, uh, of, of changing issues through the years um, that, that I've been, been uh, allowed to work on these issues. But I think there's some constants that do emerge out of the end. But if I was to break this down into sort of three three phases uh, of of reforms that have sort of occurred, or three political phases um, that have occurred since uh, uh, I began working on these issues back in Eastern Europe uh, in the mid '90s, one would be the post-communist era where we learned a lot about economic and democratic form, the area the the era of globalization. Um, that Dr. Betcher referred to a little bit. And then finally, I think sort of a post-globalist uh, period, which we, we've been discussing um, more frequently. I think that if I go back to the beginning and, of my time in working on this with the post-communist issues, some of the most interesting times to, to work, actually, because countries were take, undertaking both a, a very complex political transition from a, a communist authoritarian hybrid model um, where they were moving from, from centralized authority within a communist party to a constitutional authority uh, and, and where you had to create institutions of the rule of law, you had to create political parties. There was a lot of work really creating the mechanisms of democracy from whole cloth. Uh, and it was a fascinating process to watch uh, as it moved along. Uh, and then on the side of, of economies, what we saw was the, the dismantling of, of, a, of a centrally planned state system with no market levers in it whatsoever, where the incentives were stood on their head, where you actually got rewarded to, to waste materials rather than to conserve them, uh, to one in which the market uh, was, the, was the primary driving force. And again, a very, very difficult transition and a, and a very traumatic transition, but it taught us a lot about how states can grapple with, with broader macroeconomic uh, issues, uh, as well as what happens inside businesses and inside firms at the micro level. Uh, you've got to remember, this was a time these state-owned firms, for instance, that were privatized, didn't have accounting standards. They didn't have salespeople. They didn't really even have a management structure that could cope in a, in a market economy. And, and what, we, what we found was that we were having to create these systems without the human capacity, trained people, people who understood what things should look like, uh, to help things reform. And I think what we learned out of that period was that it was possible to make great strides, um, but there were also great failures because people made, made assumptions uh, about economic reform and democratic transition that somehow you just had to sort of overnight create a market, just add water, you would have instant democracy or instant market economy. And we learned pretty quickly that that wasn't so. Uh, Kim, uh, referred earlier to rule of law issues and governance issues. And what we found was that the lack of the rule of law, the lack of governance institutions allowed corruption and downright criminal activity to, per to permeate inside uh, of these firms, inside of government uh, for, for these elites that were communists to transition themselves into more mafia-like elites, if you will, that tried to control both the economy and the political systems. Uh, and in some countries, such as Russia, we've seen that consolidated uh, into, a, into a, a, a state really based on the interests of people aligned with the security services, uh, where you really don't have any free control of the economy, uh, where, where the state acts in service uh, to these elites uh, and their economic interests. So we learned out of that period, I think, that, that we really do need to pay attention to institutions. We do need to pay attention to the rule of law. That second phase of globalization 
were, uh, were for many people, and I think many in South Asia, uh, were very good years, years of, of, of robust growth. Um, it was the ascendancy of the global supply chain as multinational corporations began to expand their, their manufacturing. Uh, it was the boom time in China, but also the boom time in Bangladesh, a boom time in, in India, boom time in, in Pakistan. Uh, and what we saw were these global value chains of multinational corporations beginning to reach into local producers. Um, the markets were expanding within these countries as well. Uh, the middle class was expanding uh, within these countries. And we saw it, it really the development of an international rules-based order. So the rule of law in order to support these multinationals and to help support free competition and free markets the international rule of law began to become very important. So we saw institutions like the World Trade Organization take a much stronger role. We saw the development of, of the OECD and other groups that really attempted to make rules for people to behave by when they entered commerce. Uh, and there was a general consensus around these issues about how a company should behave, uh, how trade should work, uh, you know, how to, how to um, how to, how to govern economies in, in, align, in alignment with these global standards. Um, but, as, but we didn't see everything uh, uh, come out as, as we had hoped, I think, towards, towards that period, because we also saw things like the governance gap that Ken, Ken referred to open up. Uh, we had global aspirations for rule of law and, and markets, but in local countries, the local restrictions, the local ability of the local private sector or the regional government in place wasn't there to really support the aspirations of globalization. And so we saw gaps uh, between laws on the books and, and, and international commitments and what actually happened in countries. Um, and we also saw, I think, as money began to move around the world in a much quicker and much easier fashion, we started to see the emergence of international corruption and the flow of funds uh, from corrupt countries uh, into, into Western markets. Uh, we, and often, you know, uh, facilitated, if you will, by, by uh, laws that were originally created to encourage the development of markets and to encourage the development of firms, to encourage the development of business deals. And they were exploited by the corrupt because they used them instead to, to hide money, to hide the movement of funds. And certainly, in the last few years, we've, we've learned to look for these things, whether it was the Panama Papers uh, that we saw or other, other scandals where we saw how people were using beneficial ownership to hide the movement of money. We saw the, the explosion of property markets in cities like London and Miami uh, and New York, where people would take the money because they, they couldn't keep it safely in their own corrupt countries and invest it in real estate or other projects in, in, in places where they could trust the rule of law. Uh, and, and develop that. Uh, so we, we started to see, see sort of the dark side of globalization emerge during this period as well. But I will say the other piece that, that we do need to point out is digital optimism, that we started to understand that the digital economy, that, that, uh, that, the, that um, the internet could provide uh, a, a space, both for civil society and democracy, but also for economies. Uh, and it was a period, that, that period of globalization, I think, was a period of intense optimism about the potential role that, that social media could play uh, for democracy support, that the, the way the, 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 the digital financial transactions could move money, could move goods, uh, could sell goods uh, at a pace never before seen. So there was a lot of optimism about the, the outcomes that would come from the digital economy, but we hadn't figured out those rules yet. And we still are struggling with that, but we hadn't figured out those rules of the game. Uh, and I think that's a shortcoming that, that, that came forward in this last stage that we're in right now, or most recent stage, which is this post-globalization period. And in the case of the digital economy, we're seeing now uh, a, a war of words and a war of deeds over what the internet will look like. How will the internet be governed? with authoritarian states like China and Russia having a, a, a sort of surveillance-based model for the internet uh, and, and other economies still looking to, to, to reach the promise of what the digital economy could have been in, in that period of globalization. Uh, and I think we're seeing a bifurcation of the internet right now along those lines. But really what we saw in the post-globalization was where globalization had failed. 
And globalization failed, as I mentioned earlier, to really address the needs of the, the working classes, primarily in the Western economies, uh, when, when, when industries relocated uh, to emerging markets and global supply chains became very vital. We, democracies, especially in, in Europe and in North America, failed to address the needs of those being left behind. So it wasn't really a failure of globalization. It was a failure of a domestic response to the challenges that globalization put forth. And I think that's what we see in a lot of places around the world where we've seen, um, where we've seen strife in societies. It, it really comes down to the fact that the, the, the democratic institutions in these societies were slow to respond. We're slow to pick up the challenge, slow to realize the challenge, and then slow to respond. And that's, that's partly the nature of democracy itself. Democracy is a reactive force often. It waits till a situation has manifested before it can respond. And I think what we saw in this post-globalized uh, period is democracy starting to struggle with it. In our country, the United States, uh, it's very visible. It's been very visible for the last six or seven years, I would say. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in the midst of renegotiating our social contract, if you will. Uh, and, and here the, the tensions in democracy become apparent. Uh, but I think also the resilience of democracy um, becomes apparent. And I would also add, too, this period has been uh, a, a period where we've seen, as, as Dr. Betcher mentioned, the rise of the authoritarian challenge uh, to democracy, to question whether democracy works, uh, to question whether markets work, uh, and, and, and competition work. And I think that is, that is the, the point we're finding ourselves at okay. now. Um, we're at a point of conflict. Uh, Professor Yaz, uh, in your opinion, uh, does South Asia have the potential to emerge as a role model uh, in democratic renewal? What are those possibilities at the regional or those anchors at the country level, Professor Yaz? Jalur, before we look into the potential, we need to re revisit what we are witnessing and what has happened in South Asia. Uh, perhaps in, in, in many ways, it has been the case globally too. I mean, uh, the, the backsliding that we have witnessed, uh, what are the elements that are significant in case of South Asia? One is the executive aggrandizement, that we have seen how the power has shifted to the executive, uh, practically bypassing, or in some cases, as a violent, uh, you know, very supportive legislative body. Judiciary's independence have been cut in many cases. India is a case in point where we have seen the judiciary time to time has taken stand, but uh, most of the time it hasn't or the media's freedom has shrunk remarkably. So those are the lessons that you'll have to look into. Uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned about uh, the resilience. Yes, I'm optimistic too, that if we look at the past two years, decades, uh, what happened? This is the third wave that we are witnessing now has gone. Uh, so it is the third reverse wave, let me say. That means on previous occasion, it has bounced back and it will bounce back at some point. So at the end, I am optimistic about the resilience, but unless we learn the lesson, uh, and what are the lessons globally and what are the lessons in case of uh, South Asia? Uh, and one other thing that is in case of South Asia that I, I am, not only South Asia, globally as well, but most importantly in case of South Asia as we are speaking about South Asia is the, the dark cloud I call China because of its presence. And it is not only, you know, it's not the deep pocket I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the ideological challenge it has posed to the uh, liberal order. You know, we have been talking about the globalization. Uh, one other impact that we cannot simply escape, in case of South Asia, that despite the fact that globalization has offered uh, uh, some kind of a boom in economy, GDP has grown, but inequality has grown enormously. India, is, India perhaps demonstrated more clearly. Bangladesh is a case in point where we have seen. So, so long this inequality is being produced, there's a likelihood that the, the confidence on the democratic institution is going to continue to erode. Uh, the people's lack of confidence in democratic institutions needs to be restored. When you are talking about the renewal, those are the things that needs to be. On the one hand, those who are in power, the authoritarian governments and those who aspire to be authoritarian and the systems, what they are doing is practically 
peeling off the democratic institution where they were instituted. In other cases, the democratic institutions were either weak or non-existent. Uh, electoral system, for example, in case of Bangladesh, the entire uh, you know electoral system seems to be decimated by design. In case of Pakistan, that we have seen that uh, you know the civil society and the media uh, has been uh, facing enormous challenges. So those are the questions that we need to understand. And practically, one of the uh, major elements in order to become the, if you call it the beacon, if you call it the, the renewal of global democracy, uh, is this question of economy and inequality question. Uh, it is, it's very difficult to bypass that, you know, because one of the reasons that I see is the questioning the, the very foundation of democracy comes from uh, the, those who have left on the margin. And here, <laughs> let me a little bit uh, disagree with uh, Dr. Wilson. Uh, the enormous fate that we try to put on the middle class seems to be, at least at this point, I'm not very convinced anymore that the, that the middle class actually promotes democracy. Uh, Later, I've been working on the democracy, uh, the role of middle class. And, uh, you know, take for India, 1990, globalization, rise of the middle class, and the erosion of democracy. Philippines, Turkey, for example, Bangladesh. Uh, so having that faith on middle class, the middle class would actually pressure for democracy. We need to revisit that too, you know. Martin Lipset, the political scientist, who suggested that one, or Barrington Wood, for example, no bourgeoisie, no democracy kind of argument. Uh, may tend to be fine with the middle, uh, with the Western world. The erosion of democracy in the United States or the Europe in, in part is because of the eroding uh, uh, middle class. But is it also true for Turkey? Is it also true for Bangladesh? Is it also true for the Philippines? I'm not sure. I'm not sure means that rather I see the data somewhat differently. That's why in case of South Asia, for the renewal, we need to look into this you know, not so obvious elements of it. How globalization has created a permanent underclass, we need to look into. Globalization has provided some elements of good, but it has also created some problems. And the, we cannot simply continue the way the globalization has worked. So I am optimistic about resilience. And Dr. Vecha has mentioned about the collective action. I have no doubt in my mind that that is the only way to go. At the end of the day, I still believe, and I conquered Dr. Richard, that, you know, uh, that people, whether it's in India, whether it's in Sri Lanka, whether it's in Bangladesh or Nepal, they want democracy. They want a participatory system, where they, they want a system that is inclusive, both economically and politically. That is the point, that we cannot and should not be separating this economic question from the political institutions and the political aspiration. That is where the renewal question is there. That if we want to see a renewal of democracy, the reflection of the aspiration of the people, we need to address both the economic participation and inclusiveness as well as political inclusiveness. It, it has become inseparable it has been inseparable, but now it has become more obvious that it's inseparable. And that is where the possibility. Can South Asia do it? Yes, I can. I think it can. Uh, India's lesson should be there. Uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, it is possible. It's difficult. As Dr. Wilson has rightly mentioned, the democracy is messy. And it has rebound, and I am optimistic in the long term. But what we see now is not a very optimistic picture. Okay, but we are almost at the end of the program, so we don't have enough time. Uh, but Dr. Bichar, 435 policy interventions are absolutely necessary in defending democracies against uh, authoritarianism. And what role does the private sector play in this process? You have two minutes, please. All right, thank you. Uh, first, one has to look at the the, the special challenges and opportunities in each country. Don't try to make your democracy become New Zealand or, or Denmark or Japan or what have you. And uh, so Bangladesh um, is, is famous for, for its non-government organizations. It's, it's famous for its economic policies and inclusion. So maybe build on some of the strengths. 
Uh, democracy has to be an open competitive system and that only works with freedom of association. Um, if you don't have the ability of actors to come together um, to express their views and, and, and organize and hold government accountable and better political parties are built on better social organizations. So freedom of association. Anti-corruption we've talked about, I would simply say that it's not enough to hunt down the bad actors. One has to transform the, the system and the incentives and the opportunities so more competition, more transparency, less discretion. Uh, Andrew has alluded to technology um, and, 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 and future challenges. One has to focus on governance in particular sectors. What happens between elections? how um, new models of, of regulation are, are developed to um, address these problems and, and, and opportunities will be really important. And I'm a big believer in the processes of, of public-private dialogue and, and citizen in, engagement. You have to create ideas and, and, and buy in from the population. And it's not about policies that, that come from um, a technocrat or from an external democracy assistance organization. Uh, Dr. Ria stressed the importance of inclusion. I totally agree. I think entrepreneurship um, is a good path there. And at the end of the day, uh, so business is, is a great organizer. Business is innovative. Um, business can kind of create a lot of space for independent, pluralistic, competitive action in society. That's all great. But at the end of the day, business has to recognize that it depends on democratic norms. Um, if rule of law is, is, is challenged, if, if, if freedom of information and speech is challenged, it will suffer too. And it has to look ahead and with others in society, uh, stand up and defend democratic norms. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Uh, you led an organization with the UNIC Misha and uh, an organization that supports democracy by working with uh, and uh, through the private sector. Uh, what in your uh, view are the uh, three, five major elements of real uh, leadership by the private sector in sparing democracies like Bangladesh or across South Asia? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think there are... There are please please uh, make, make it very short. Sure. I think there are a few, few key things you've got to think about. Uh, we talked about collective action, and I think these, these organizations like Chambers of Commerce, business associations are key in that. But the, these institutions themselves must reflect the democracies that we're working in. And that's often a key shortcoming we see of, of, of chambers and business associations is that they tend to reflect the needs of perhaps the elected leadership of, the, of, of these chambers and associations and do a poor job of reflecting the overall needs of, of a business community that that is not a monolith, that is, that is, that is broad-based and, and very diverse. And so I think the better these institutions can do at, at being transparent, at listening to their membership, at really trying to represent the collective interests of the private sector, uh, the more they can contribute to, to growth and also by their example, democracy uh, within a country. Uh, professor Riaz, uh, as a uh, professor in the United States and an expert on this region, uh, what are your hopes for South Asian democracy and what a specific support can the world provide in facilitating that? In the long run, I'm optimistic. South Asia has proved to have bounced back before. The world will be bouncing back. It may take time. In so far as the particular support from the international community, there can be a long list, but I, I would emphasize on four things the international community should do. One, number one, is the insistence on rule of law and holding those who have perpetrated or violated the rule of law in some form or other, they should be held accountable. You know, and the international community should make that very clear that anyone violating the rule of law, including persecution or, you know, reigning from extrajudicial killing to God knows what else, you know. So number two is the uh, restoration of the electoral system and its integrity. Uh, there should be an emphasis, uh, with, in, in, whether it's Nepal, Maldives, or Bangladesh, that the international community should emphasize on the uh, restoration of a fair electoral system, because that is the way first step for inclusion. Not the last one, but you cannot bypass that one. Number three. Addressing the question of corruption, because that is the that has the corrosive impact on the entire system, the crony system, the everything that has been stayed there, you know, or continue to be, is because fueled by corruption. So, international community should take a stand on the corrupt, you know, addressing the corrupt factories. Fourth one that I would insist is on the civil society, the civil society, including media. There are, you know, in many cases we have seen 
how the attempts have been made, how the laws have been changed, uh, practically to vilify and criminalize the civil society action. So I think these are the first four steps that is absolutely necessary to show by the international community, particularly the United States, in, in making sure its commitment to democracy would come down to translating in, into at least these four things in an immediate manner. That, that I have no doubt in my mind. Can we extend that list? Yes, we can. But I think these are fundamental four pillars that needs to be done immediately and as practically as soon as possible. Uh, Dr. Bechtar, uh, very shortly, how can the U.S. balance its priority of ensuring its global geopolitical interests and uh, democracy in the region, I mean, the South Asia region? The United States, like, like any country, has, has many interests and, and, and many tools at its disposal. And uh, we know that in its efforts to uh, counter authoritarian superpowers or um, to uh, pursue its economic interests, there will be times when... Um, Democracy is not at the top of, of the, the U.S. foreign policy list, but it's uh, to the U.S.'s long-term benefit to show a consistent stand of support for, for democratic principles. And I, I think you're, you're seeing Andrew and myself here representing a piece of, of, of a, an American effort um, led by the National Endowment for Democracy, which... Uh, is premised on a, on a whole of society approach to assisting democracy and kind of civil society to civil society relationships across countries. So it doesn't have to be uh, the, the executive branch of a government um, alone um, pursuing um, a, a democracy policy. And within the, the National Endowment for Democracy family, we have labor, we have business represented, we have um, the democratic Party Institute and the Republican Party's Institute. And, and we work with a wide range of, of, of actors and constituencies in other countries, um, including youth and, and women and economic organizations and political parties and so forth. So I think that this is a, a good model that uh, we remember that democracy is created by the people in each country and by um, civil society and, and it's not purely um, a government project. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, we often see that there is security cooperation between the United States uh, of America and some of the undemocratic governments, uh, which helps them to avoid criticism. How do you explain this US ap uh, approach? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you know, it, it is a factor of foreign policy in the United States um, that uh, there's always this struggle between the idealistic side of foreign policy, uh, which would be our support for Democrats around the world and, and, and putting in place a, 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 a series of support for democracy programs, and those of security and commercial interests. And, and often um, that's called in the United States realist foreign policy. And the, the trick that the United States really must grapple with right now and in terms of its foreign policy is, is trying to balance out um, the, the needs and the desires of realist foreign policy, which really has driven U.S. foreign policy um, really since the early 70s, and this more idealistic format where we, we think about our ideals. And I think the, the trick for the United States is to have a realist foreign policy that does concern the security issues and the commercial interests, but have, have this sort of idea about democracy at its base. Why are we doing all of this? Why do we have a security policy? Why do we have uh, a, a strong foreign commercial policy. We do that because we believe um, ultimately that the success of our own democracy is at stake. Uh, and through the success of our own democracy, we can, we can work with other, other uh, democracies around the world to, to create this, this system, this, this global system of, of, of values and, and practices. Um, and I think that that's, that's at the heart of the struggle right now. Uh, and that's why you're seeing the Summit for Democracies take on uh, such a visible um, uh, uh, appearance right now. Uh, this administration, I think, is, is having that discussion uh, and is trying to say, yes, we do need foreign policy that has democracy as a stronger element of it than perhaps we've had in the last 15 years. 
Dr. Riaz, uh, it will seem to many that Americans' involvement in the South Asia region currently is very much aligned with the interest of regional superpower India. Uh, do you think uh, there is a benefit in making more room in U.S. foreign policy uh, for the smaller nations of Asia, such as Bangladesh, instead of viewing their geostrategic importance uh, through the lens of India? I, th I do. I think that U.S. policy over the last decade or so, uh, focusing more on, on I would call the Delhi-centric, New Delhi-centric uh, approach, has not uh, benefited the region, particularly of democracy cushion, if you see. India is no longer the role model in, of democracy in South Asia. Unfortunately, it's true. I understand that the U.S. policy has been Washington's approach, and you, you mentioned in the, in the previous question to Dr. Wilson that uh, it is looking through the security prism. Uh, this dichotomy, this binary that has been set uh, in the long run is not exactly right, because in long-term democratic nations are more... Uh, a safety to the U.S. policy and, and security of the you know, world order than authoritarian. In similar fashion, you know, India-centric approach. Understandably, India is seen as the antidote to the Chinese influence. Understand? I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, utopian on this. It is, uh, you know, it is it is very much a very realistic uh, or realist approach to it. But having the India practically a blank check, uh, doesn't help uh, you know, promotion of democracy, preserving the democracy in the region. You know, that's why, uh, similarly, it, it happened in case, if you, if you look at the Afghan policy and having so much dependent on Pakistan, and writing blank check for Pakistan for two decades didn't help. Uh, having Putting all your eggs into one basket doesn't help. And given the increasing geopolitical importance of the region, and particularly Bangladesh, since we're talking to the Bangladeshi audience, I think there should be a clear reassessment of the policy. It doesn't have to be through New Delhi. It can be New Delhi on the one hand, and the other countries such as Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, on the uh, on a, 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 you know different basket. There can be two-track policy and approach uh, that I expect that it should be looked into, and I hope. That should be the case because experience is telling us that it didn't work for the United States and particularly for democracy in the long run in the region. Indeed, uh, this was a fascinating discussion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Andrew Wilson, uh, Dr. Kim Becher, and Professor Ali Riaz for being with us. Uh, President Biden will host a virtual summit for leaders from government, public society, and the private sector on December 9 and 10, 2021. The summit will uh, concentrate on the challenges and possibilities uh, that democracies face and it will give a forum uh, for leaders to make individual and uh, collective commitment, uh, commitments uh, to safeguard democracy and human rights both at home and abroad. According to Biden's camp, uh, the summit will provide a chance for the United States uh, to listen, learn and uh, engage with a wide spectrum of players whose support and commitment are important for global democratic renewal. Uh, the Biden administration has committed uh, to making democratic assistance a priority in U.S. foreign policy, uh, increasing expectations for a more proactive American involvement in reversing the worldwide democratic decline. Uh, to keep this pace, uh, the president must give a strong leadership, clearly stating his intentions to the American people and partners throughout the world. If there is a proper follow through on the summit's promises, uh, it could become a strong demonstration of how open rights respecting communities may col collaborate to successfully address today's big issues, including the COVID-19 pandemic, climate catastrophe, and rising inequality. Thank you, viewers. Thank you for being with us.